Do we get started here, George? Yeah, that should okay. be done. All right, well, welcome everyone to uh, Anat Abdi presents a conversation between Sarah Ann Weber and Faith Wilding entitled Sisters of the Sun, which takes its name from the essay that George also penned on the presentation for the Freeze Viewing Room. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, before we get started, I just want to give a little introduction to um, the three people who are going to be speaking today. Uh, firstly, my name is Stefano. I'm the director uh, of Not Epke in Los Angeles. Um, but our three participants will be Sarah Ann Weber, George William Price, and Faith Wilding. So I'd like to start with our moderator, George William Price. He is the director of collections at the University Club of Chicago, where he is responsible for the curation, conservation, and development of all of the club's collections. Prior to his position at the University Club of Chicago, George was the development and marketing manager for the Video Data Bank. Uh, in this role, he led Video Data Bank's promotional and development efforts, managed the submissions and acquisitions process, and was also responsible for the organization's external community relations. Price has curated and administered numerous exhibitions and moving image programs for institutions such as Conversations at the Edge, Chicago Urban Art Society, Rapid Pulse International Performance Festival, and the University of Arts London. He has also worked for a number of arts, organiz arts organizations in both the US and UK, including Matt's Gallery London, Electronic Arts Intermix New York City, and Chicago Artists Coalition. Next, we have Sarah Ann Weber, who was born in Chicago, uh, received her BFA from the School of the Art Institute, and she would go on to receive her MFA from the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Uh, in 2013, she was awarded the Oxbow Scholarship, which was funded by the Joan Mitchell Foundation. She had her first solo exhibition with our gallery last year, and we also hosted a solo presentation at Expo Chicago last September. Uh, Weber has had additional solo exhibitions uh, at venues including Club Pro Los Angeles, Sometimes Salon San Francisco, The Franklin Chicago, and Rena Sternberg Gallery in Glencoe. She's also participated in group exhibitions at Minnesota Street Project, the Brand Library and Art Center in Glendale, Mauve Gallery in Vienna, uh, Green Gallery in Milwaukee, uh, Locust Projects in Miami, and Andrew Rafish in Chicago. And she's lived and worked in Los Angeles for the last six years. Uh, nextly, we have a woman who I think needs very little introduction, but I'll give you a little bit of a bio, uh, you know, personal icon and hero, uh, Miss keep Faith Wildbane. Keep it short, keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> well, she has uh, exhibited extensively over the last five decades, including the Reina Sofia in Madrid, the Center for Contemporary Arts in Glasgow, the Bronx Museum, the Whitney Museum, the Hammer Museum, the Drawing Center at Documenta uh, in Castle, and the Singapore Art Museum. She's also included numerous museum exhibitions, including the Hammer, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, Wilding has been the recipient of two individual media grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, and in 2009 was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. And in 2014, she was awarded the prestigious Women's Caucus for Lifetime Achievement Award. She is the Professor Emerita of Performance Art at the School of the Art Institute, and on the graduate faculty at the Vermont College of Fine Arts, and a visiting scholar at the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women at Brown University. I just want to keep going a little bit, um, but alongside Miriam Shapiro and Judy Chicago and other women art students, Wilding co-initiated the feminist art program at CalArts and uh, the California State University at Fresno. She is one of the founding members of the feminist art movement in Southern California, which she chronicled in her hugely influential book, By Our Own Hands, in 1976. Um, she was recently on view in the exhibition Where Art Might Happen, The Early Years of CalArts, curated by Philip Kaiser and Christina Vey. And her pieces, Pages from the Scriptorium Black Dog, is also in the collection of the University Club and on view right now at the MCA Chicago in the exhibition Seeing Chicago, curated by Duro Alolu. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to our panelists today. Uh, thank you so much, Stefano, um, uh, and Nat and the rest of the team for having me. It's uh, always a joy to be in conversation with Sarah and Faith. Uh, Sarah, I was actually just thinking, you know, we just had a, a studio visit in LA in February uh, during Freeze LA, and I, I just can't believe that time has already passed. So it's it's kind of mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but here we are, and it is Tuesday, if anyone else needed a reminder, I certainly did. 
Um, so just to kind of get us started, um, thinking about the short text that I wrote, um, you know, it really explores the intergenerational connections between Faith and Sarah, the deep connections to Chicago, Sarah being a native Chicagoan, and then Faith as the chair of SEAC's performance department from 2000 to 2011. Um, you know, as artists that embrace so-called women's work um, from paper and pencil to watercolor and performance. Um, and then, you know, really thinking about Sarah's work, mining the aesthetics of the 1970s, the time when Faith was deeply involved in the, uh, the women's movement on the West Coast, uh, where Sarah now resides. So I have a few questions and um, I hope we can keep this uh, fun and chatty as we move through for both of you. Um, so, you know, we've been talking, you know, outside of this and really thinking about the role of the artist, the citizen artist, the activist artist and the artisan. Um, Faith, maybe could you talk a little bit about um, what you feel has changed, if anything, in your role during your career? And Sarah, perhaps you could just uh, comment on the lineage that you draw upon within your practice. Maybe I'll hand it over to Faith first. Um, uh, what did you ask me? Sorry. I'm a oh, very, very little I'm really person. thinking about the role of the artist and if you could expand oh, on no. that and how it's changed in the past 50 years for you. <laughs> for Let's me, personally, hmm. Um, well, it's changed a lot because um, I didn't even intend to become an artist. Um, I mean, an official artist. Um, I was studying literature. Um, but of course, I was studying William Blake. And of course, as a child, I always made art. So um, it just didn't seem like a possibility, like a possibility for me that I would, that I could be an artist because everybody knows artists don't make money, right? How do they support themselves? <laughs> so um, it was very much about, you know, um, becoming a teacher, actually. But um, I think everything changed when I, um, moved to Fresno with my then husband um, and um, met Suzanne Lacey and then, and we started a feminist group together. And this was like in 80, no, in 68, 69, something like that. And then Judy Chicago came to Fresno and she was immediately brought to my house and introduced to me and, and we kind of, you know, and so that, changed everything in a certain way for me because um, I suddenly was part of the feminist art program <laughs> and there um, we, we worked in so many different media. I mean, it was not about media, it was about um, content. It was about um, a new kind of content and thinking about um, what does it mean to be a woman and a woman artist. And so of course it was, you know, the late sixties, um, the big, you know, the really, and I'd been involved in a lot of the sixties political issues and, you know, been, a, been in jail, been, you know, marched, um, all of that stuff. So I was, um, you know, from, from the very beginning, it was politicized. The whole act of making art was politicized. Also having studied William Blake, whose work um, really um, is very political in, in a very particular way. So, um, so that kind of launched me into this weird thing called art making, um, which is, turns out I'd been doing all of my life as a child, you know, seriously sitting in front of plants and drawing them, which is like <laughs> apparently a thing that artists do, <laughs> so. Thank you. Sarah, maybe you wanna talk a little bit about how you see your role as an artist? Yeah, I, I mean, my, my experience is in some ways similar to Faith's and then in other ways very different. I, I mean, as a kid, yes, definitely always drawing, always making art. Um, but I, I thought, I always thought it could be something I would pursue. And yeah, the jokes of, oh, you won't make money as an artist were definitely there, but I just sort of didn't care about that. And, uh, 
Um, I also, you know, went to school and, and, and I don't know if the political was so tied to my experience as, as like an, an artist, you know, in art school and things like that. I think that came later after school. Um, you know, for me growing up in the nineties, I, it was a sense of like girl power and like girls can do anything and like take your daughter to work day. And I just, I sort of assumed that it was all available and possible for me. And I, I felt that way all through school. And then it was only like after leaving like the institutions that I started to really observe, you know, the realities uh, that, you know, things weren't fair or that like women still really had to work like twice as hard. Um, and, you know, it was more of a struggle. And that's sort of when like my awareness of like how my art could be tied with like the political like came into focus for me. Um, and, and just going back to what you said, George, about like the role of the artist as like citizen activist and artisan, I think the thing that ties them all together for me is the artist's role as observer and kind of witness to, to everything that's going on, um, the natural world, but also what, what's happening in society and culture and just really paying attention to, to everything that's going on. Um, so that, that to me is like what I see as like my most important uh, role is, is to observe. I think that's a, a really interesting point. I, I think Faith, you've talked a lot about this, about being a, a scribe, right? And, and creating and, and writing your own history and how necessary that is um, in order to, you know, uh, secure a legacy. Um, Faith, you know, you've, you've always um, you've talked about the, the physical body as a sort of political site. Um, which I think is something you've engaged with for your entire career, you know, from your seminal performance waiting to your collaborative work with Sub Rosa. I'm interested to kind of hear more about your thoughts about this and collective activism, you know, as we rapidly move further and further into the digital networked and virtual. I'm really thinking about like this Freeze New York presentation, right, where, and, and Zoom, where we're kind of interacting with each other um, digitally, you know, rather than physically, and you and how that um, changes the political nature, you know, of, of your work. Yeah, as you may notice, some of these works that are being shown here of mine um, might remind you of illuminated manuscripts. Sarah, that's a gorgeous piece we're looking at right now. Oh my good goodness, that's like that's, that's like the unicorn tapestry or something. I'm. <laughs> Extremely, I've always been extremely um, engaged and interested in in the Middle Ages. <laughs> As a child, I was like King Arthur and his knights. Oh my God! You know, I and anything I could read and find out about the Middle Ages. So and this, and then I was very interested in the the um, crazy sacred nuns of the Middle Ages. Um, people like Hildegard von Bingen, who I read about as a, as a young child in German, um, and go like, wow, you know? And um, so I'm, I don't know what I'm supposed to be talking about, George. Sorry, I've lost, I've <laughs> run off the rails again. But, um, okay. I mean, I think it's coming back to- um, The body. Yeah, the body. Uh, yeah, yeah the so the, and the body today, and yeah, the, you know, the which body of course was a huge thing in feminism, right? You know, I mean, remembering in the very first feminist um, consciousness raising group, you know, and we were going like, um, women can have orgasms, and they were like, what? You know, and word got out that we were going to be talking about that in the consciousness raising group. And suddenly it went from 10 people to 70 people. So it was like, you know, so we, we, t we were talking a lot about the female body in ways um, that I never had been able to do as a child. I grew up in a religious commune where we didn't have bodies, basically. Um, we just had, you know, minds. And um, so it was um, incredibly, um, uh, empowering, I should say, to actually think about my body, the body, the female body, um, in a really different way, and to be allowed to think about it. And um, that's 
you know, in fact, the, in fact, embodiment is, um, is the body is like the world, you know, and again, I'm, I'm going to Blake here with this, you know, that the, that the human body represents actually um, everything. Um, it's, it's nature, it's culture, it's, you know, it's, um, it's where it all happens, you know, and it's, um, it's still this incredible miracle that we, that we don't actually understand in so many ways, you know, how, what bodies actually are and have become, mm -hmm. you know, and how they've evolved um, with nature, which is also something we don't deeply understand, you know, so there's this really miraculous aspect to the body and I'm waxing very poetic here but I feel that way you know about the body I, I think so, Faith like we we both we both share that and I think we you can see it in our works um just with like the hybridization of forms where it's like the the body is so connected to nature in both of our works you know it's like I with a lot of my figures it's like they're they're really only present because of the plants that are kind of forming on top of their their skin um and with you like there's this like like there are like figures that become animalistic and yeah i i agree it's it's there it's all very mysterious but there's there are these strong connections i think to, to the, the physical body and our physical worlds um that you know unfortunately now with like quarantine and like sheltering in place it's sometimes feels like there's a removal but um i think that's why like our work or at least you know in my work i'm going to try to like push that even more because you know mm -hmm. we don't want to lose that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Connection. no i think that's a really nice point there and, and thinking about um the idea of hybridization right and and looking yeah. at the, you know this this current body of work and you know how your figures uh, you know are revealed you know in their absence in that kind of removal from the scene and then uh faith i'm thinking about uh three dragons one goddess where you've got this beautiful form of a, a woman erupting from a seed um and you know kind of engaging in this this, this dance almost with this dragon I, you know i think is really really gorgeous um, and something to think about. And, you know, um, Faith, you've always used, um, you know, imagery from nature as a kind of metaphor for transformation. And maybe that's something that uh, you two want to kind of touch on and, and, and think about. Um, Luna, go ahead, Faith. Yeah, transformation, um, you said it. <laughs> um, I mean, and especially given this, the, the current situation as well, yeah. you know, thinking mm -hmm. about um, you know, our engagement with the natural world right now, which... Yeah, yeah, know. and 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 I also was thinking about Donna Haraway's um, sort of the latest word, and this, this piece really identifies it, the tentacular. She talks about the tentacular, that um, we sh should think about our environment and ourselves as tentacular, that is, it can go in all of these different directions. It can move through all of these different spaces. It can entwine itself with all aspects of, of nature and of humanity and of thought and that we're not separated, but we're all one big sort of tentacular organism is kind of the way she puts it in some of her very weird, but very inspiring writing you know i i love to um resort to reading her writing because it, it becomes very visualized for me and some of these pieces that you're seeing actually come out of re reading some of her work and thinking about these these um concepts that she's bringing forth how we are connected together and how we're connected to the world basically to to, to all of creation mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting, actually, also how like um, kind of late capitalism has adopted that, you know, the idea of kind of tendrils sort of sprawling out across the world. It, it, it's interesting yeah. how that's that's reflected too. Yes. Sarah, did you have a evil word? side of it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love that word too, and I I I see that happening in my own work. I I always think about um, growth and decay and kind of how those 
two um, states are kind of always happening and in conjunction with each other and like in flux. Um, so with my work, I'll, I'll have all of these, you know, strange plants that are kind of growing and decaying at the same time. I, I sort of think of my work as this like suspension of, um, you know, kind of like a lava lamp where <laughs> it's like both of these, these things are just kind of happening all at once. Um, mm -hmm. And, and yeah, I think that has to do with the, te the tentacular where it's like, you know, you could be going in one direction and there's movement and life, but then, you know, what does that leave in its wake or something, you know, um, with that growth? I, I think they, they have to be connected. Well, it's also about time, right? That time is circular in nature, it's not linear. And so I think for, for all of your works, right, that, that, that kind of, again, holds it in suspension and you really play with that. As Definitely, well. yeah, and, and and movement I I think is so key mm -hmm. to, to have this sense mm -hmm. of of something growing in a, a two dimensional work of art. I I think you know like the detail and and sort of um, the elong elongated forms that we both kind of instinctively go to uh, are are really key to like showing that sense of time and movement. Yeah, it's interesting to me. Um, Sarah, um, how, how our forms are quite um, similar in many ways. Mm -hmm. Our color is really different. And that's really interesting to me. You know, when I first saw your color, I'm going like, wow, um, lots more blue. <laughs> cool. It's cool. I use a lot of blue too, but somehow it's cooler the color is cooler but on the other hand it's kind of so dazzling that it's almost yeah like this for example you know it's like the bodies are illuminated mm -hmm. uh, in in a you know in this kind of like you can hardly look at it because it's gonna hurt your eyes kind <laughs> of you know brilliance which partly i'm attributing to the california sun I think that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's in, you know, the light is so different there than, um, than it is here in Providence, you know, Rhode Island. I mean, it's just really, and of course I grew up in South America. So, you know, the light was similar to what, to what, what's in Los Angeles, except that the vegetation was so different. So that, um, you know, thinking about this kind of illuminated, you know, transparent, transformed kind of light mm -hmm. in, in your work. And well, and I think we both, um, I mean, we're both, you know, you reference the, the Middle Ages. I always go back to, you know, medieval tapestry design as like a huge source of inspiration. And we, we share that. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we also share this intuitive way of building our compositions and there's this this biomorphic abstraction that happens in our work but i think that extends itself to the color as well um i mean i it's yeah i definitely see kind of patterns in my work or certain colors that i gravitate to and i see that in your work also um but i mean for me it's such an intuitive process and i can only assume that it's similar for you where you're just like, oh, this is the color that I need to use at this moment. And I'm not quite sure why, but that's, that's yeah. what happens. Yeah, it's an interesting thing, because as a teacher, um, one of the things we do is critique, right? And so critique, um, one of the questions of critique is always like, how do you make this decision, right? Tell me how you made this decision. You know, and often the students are just looking at it going like, Ah, uh, ah, mm, uh, you know, and I was saying, like, how did I make this decision? I don't know. I've been making art for like, you know, forty-five years, and I just had to grab that particular blue, you know. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I, I know. I remember learning about color theory, or like when I first learned about yeah. perspective, and being terrified of, oh no, I'm going to do this wrong because it, there's some kind of equation or formula to it. Yeah. And then I realized, like, oh, you you can just do whatever you want. <laughs> it just became so much easier to make art after that. Um, coming back to this question around California light, I mean, Sarah, do you think you could just touch a little bit on this Children of the Sun anthology that you've been using as source material for this series? I think it's just kind of really fascinating. 
Yeah, well, and that also ties my work with faiths too. Um, so Children of the Sun is this anthology that I um, was given as a gift last year. And it's just a small book of black and white photographs that kind of chronicle um, like German naturalist movements and how they made their way to Southern California in the early 20th century. So, um, you know, German naturalist movements where it was just like a liberation of the body in nature that was happening in the mid 19th century. Um, and then that sort of became kind of popularized and, you know, spurred things like the California diet and just like being in the sun, being in nature, um, you know, eating vegetarian, things like that. Um, but it, it's just this, this great photographic resource um, just with these black and white photographs that I use as source material for my works. Um, just because when, I'm, when I am drawing the body, sometimes I like to look at a reference. Um, and I, I feel it, you know, Faith, if you want to talk about like your upbringing, like you, you grew up in a community that really valued those German naturalist movements and were kind of living it to its full. Is that, is that right? Sort of, yeah. I mean, they, they had all grown up in the German youth movement, you know, and this was pre-Hitler. Let me just make sure of that. <laughs> um, I was born during the Second World War. So, um, so, you know, so that's really an, an interesting kind of combination of when suddenly um, people realized that all of this German nature worship and so on was being used by the Nazis, right? It was being used in a very um, horrendous way by the Nazis. I, I once saw an exhibition of that um, in Germany and it was, it was shocking um, how much the Nazis had subverted all of this, all of this nature stuff. Um, that um, that the German youth movement had brought into into Germany, and you know, and so so um, it's a it's a very it's a very mm, it's a very problem. It can be very problematic, right? So um, you know, one has to keep that in mind. I think um, that um, you know this worship of the body and the strength of the body um, was used, can be used in many different ways, right? And, um, you know, can be, um, can, can be subverted very nastily also. But I think it's really, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, again, I refer to Blake who uses the human body as, you know, the human body is the world, basically. The human body is, you know everything it's but it's but it's transformed it transforms itself you know um in the way we were talking about before and that it connects with with nature with energy with you know with this um way of with 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 sexual strength with procreation with you know um building and making and and um so it's you know it's this really two-edged thing. Yeah. Um, actually, you know, kind of building on that and then thinking about female sexuality, you know, I think both of you, you know, kind of fully embrace that within your work, um, you know, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that, um, maybe Faith with some of your uh, earlier work as well and, and collaborative work with Sabrosa, thinking about, you know, reproductive technologies as well. And the sort of, you know, uh, mm -hmm ever changing female form. Yeah, which, um, I mean, you know, we're in a full on moment now and in, in certainly in art and, and in, in culture and in thinking about, um, you know, the, and I can't believe that in this moment, the Supreme Court is again going to consider whether abortion is, you know, allowed or not. I just don't get it. I'm sorry. You know, it's like, come on, face facts, you know. So um, anyway, um, that little rant, I'm sorry. But um, it's just, um, it's, it's how, you know, the, I love to watch Call the Midwife, um, that, that British show, which I'm completely 
crazy about. Um, and what, why, am I, why am I so crazy about it? Is because it's like these women, especially these young women, working, you know, helping other women. And, you know, they have the knowledge. They have, the, they've built this incredible knowledge. And it's a knowledge, it's, it's, it's a knowledge of care. It's a knowledge of, um, you know, really allowing the woman to feel the, feel the power of that act of, of bringing, you know, new human beings to birth, you know, and that is, this is a very, this is a very miraculous thing, you know, every birth is a miraculous thing. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's unique in a certain way in that, um, in that it's something, something in a way of like making something from nothing um, in this weird way, you know, it's like, it's like this miracle every time, you know, I, we know all about the sperm and the egg and all of this shit, you know, but it's still this just amazing thing, right, which none of us can really fathom. Um, I was just talking to my niece and, you know, seeing my little grand nephew and, and he's running around, you know, he's not even two years old yet and he's bringing me rocks and I'm going like, yay, thank you, you know, and I think this is a miracle, you know, this is a miracle. I've never given birth myself, but um, I was too, too scared, I think, but, um, you know, I think that the body, that the female body is still so much um, in question and so much, you know, um, misunderstood and mistreated. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, yeah, I'm in a way. Yeah, I, I mean, to go off of that too, I, I, I feel like, um, the the feminine body has this amazing ability to really transform and to 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 change in so many ways and obviously like pregnancy is like a perfect example of that um but i i think that's why um you know i i've i've drawn the male figure before and and a lot of my figures have more of an androgynous um feel to them and and i kind of like that hybridization of like the gender um where it's like it's it's not so it's not so important whether the figure is male or female it, it's more just that it's a human body um that is interesting to me but i also feel like you know the androgynous um the the queer body it, it has this close relationship to the feminine body and yeah. they, they kind of perfectly transition into each other for me. And, um, you know, more recently I have been, uh, uh, you know, drawing more traditionally feminine bodies um, and just like really embracing that. Um, I think just as a way to celebrate and like defend the female body, because like you said, Faith, it's like, we are still in desperate need to defend women's bodies. You know, it's like we, we have a government right now that is constantly trying working at stripping away rights for women and agency over their bodies and and now more than ever it feels like a vital time to just yeah. like celebrate the female body defend it stand up for it um in our work yeah and um building on that and i'm just going to also mention that please feel free to put questions into the chat box which i think is on the right hand side of the screen um so we can follow up those uh, afterwards but yeah i mean uh both of you engage in practices that you know could be classed as you know women's work you know and sarah you know you and i were talking you know a couple of weeks ago about pattern and decoration and you know we've all discussed um issues of labor within your work um you know Sarah, perhaps you might want to start off and talk a little bit about that and, and how this kind of uh, realization around your interest in pattern, pattern decoration, decoration has kind of been more recent, I suppose, for you. Yeah, well, I mean, I've always made very detailed drawings. I, I'm just always drawn to like excess of mark and form in my work. And I remember being in grad school and people would say things like, oh, your work is so delicate or, oh, it reminds me of of lace or, or like embroidery. 
Um, but it was always, there was like this tinge of like condescension with a lot of those comments that I feel like, you know, again, like craft and like women's traditional, like women's work is always sort of condescended to, or, you know, not seen as valuable. I mean, we're still in, in like an art market that prioritizes a painting on canvas over a drawing on paper. And, um, you know, I, so I think for me, like I, I tried to like fully embrace that instead, instead of trying to like, you know, deny those like women or craft instincts within my own work. I try to just like double down on them and like, you know, like I'll show you details, like <laughs> just see how crazy I can go with this. Um, just as kind of like an act of rebellion, I guess. But but again, also like embracing um, the feminine and like women's work and labor. Um, yeah, so I, did that sort of answer? <laughs> I feel like I went off on a little bit of a- <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> and uh, Faith, same question to you. There's this great book um, that I always recommend to my students called The Subversive Stitch. Um, one of those, you know, really brilliant British Marxist art historians wrote it. Can't remember her name right now. Um, and she talks about these centuries and centuries of labor, um, of, of, you know, really careful and, you know, loving labor that um, women in particular have, have put, and it's not just women, of course, but, you know, it, you know, it's always been a woman's role to, to make these, to make stuff, right? To, to make something out of nothing, to make something work, to make something, to clothe somebody, some, something to warm you, something, and making it beautiful, um, taking this care. Um, when I think, you know, in Paraguay, for example, the, um, the, indigenous um, Guarani people were taught by the Portuguese, um, by the wives of Portuguese conquerors, how to make lace, um, which comes, which came from Portugal, this lace thing. And the, the Portuguese lace is very beautiful. It's, it's all white and everything. So the, um, the Guarani um, women made, took this lace making and made it into their own language. And they call it, they call it Nyan, call it Nyan, but Nyan Buti in Guarani. And, and they dye the lace with all of these different colors. And it, it takes on the forms of, of many different flowers and leaves um, that, that grow in Paraguay. So, um, you know, I was always incredibly um, interested in, in this, in this lace and in, in this um, idea of um, making patterns out of thread um, and you know sort of so I've for completely forgotten what I'm supposed to be talking about as usual I've gotten really off topic well I think that the, um, to bring it back to something that we were talking about um, the other day Faith is, is um, you know, like the pencil tip, like we both draw or, you know, using watercolor um, as yeah. opposed to, you know, using spray paint or like, you know, using a really big brush to make these large gestural moves. Um, you know, both of our work, we draw. And so it just, it's, it is, it has this relationship to like sewing or embroidery because mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. literally, it's like, you know, you're just paying so much attention to these small areas and you're covering, you know, just small surfaces at a time. And, and then that accumulation like leads, leads to the finished work. Um, but yeah, I feel like drawing and like the sense of time um, is, is very much related to craft. Yeah, absolutely. It is a craft, definitely. Yeah. So this kind of, you know, valuation, again, of craft mm -hmm. um, is something that the feminist art movement definitely, you know, um, 
size. And you see it all the time now, these incredible shows. Oh, my internet connection is unstable. It says, well, okay. Um, you know, you see it all the time. Um, craft is hugely valued these days. You know, it's so in. <laughs> Everybody's knitting and sewing. And, you know, because one of the things, right after 9-11, Everybody formed knitting circles. They, you know, they found out how incredibly soothing it was to make, to actually make something, you know, to put something together and to kind of sit together and to knit together, you know, and talk to each other and, you know, be making something. Mm -hmm. So this whole idea of, you know, making something from nothing, it's like the spider, right? Making, you know, exuding this thing that makes this incredible net. You know, so it's it's really, yeah, it's very it's very um, deep. I think mm -hmm. certainly in my tradition, the way I was brought up, and um, sounds like you too, Sarah, have, have yeah. that. Yeah, I, I mean, my family um, they have a bakery that I grew up working in, and you know, I think that it's you know it's funny you bring up like the knitting circles after 9 11 and i can't help but think of like everybody baking sourdough bread during this <laughs> right. uh, and, and again i think it, it's just that uh it's comforting like there's something about and, and it's very rewarding to to make something um you know when i when I'm at the studio and I'm here working on something and then at the end of the day I can see oh wow I I made marks I I put pencil to paper and there is something here now that wasn't hours ago uh it feels really satisfying and it, it's very therapeutic yeah yeah that's true um, I just want to keep an eye on time, and we, and we do have a question or two, but I, I kind of building on this, I, I'm just interested in um, whether the, the, you know, the time has passed during this um, unprecedented time, as people love to describe it as, you know, has your practice changed at all, you know, your engagement with time, your perception of time, um, again, I think coming back to some of these questions around labor um, and attention. I mean, I think for me, I've, I was definitely forced to slow down <laughs> because of this. Um, I, you know, packed up all of my supplies at the studio at, you know, a couple months ago and I moved them all to my house and, you know, I, I like to make large scale works, but that sort of, you know, wasn't an option for the time being. So just working at my kitchen table and, and that becoming the studio was a shift. Um, but in some ways it was really nice because I would stop in the middle every day and like go on long walks in my neighborhood and just sort of see all these plants kind of bursting with life and, you know, the, the streets were quiet. Um, and so it was definitely a more reflective time because when, you know, my studio is in an industrial area in like downtown LA. And so normally when I'm at the studio, it's, I'm just in my zone i'm not going outside i'm not stopping to take a walk or something like that so for me it's been really reflective um and uh yeah i think it's just sort of a reassessment of like you know what what is important and i mean i've definitely still been making art throughout this whole time and you know that to me has really kept my sanity and uh, i'm so happy <laughs> that i that i have that to, to turn to Totally, yeah, I'm 100% with you there, Sarah, right? Um, we have one question. Um, someone's interested in, Sarah, your piece, Ambassador, um, Ambassador Hotels Return, just the kind of origins of that title, and maybe we can, I don't know if it's up on the screen right now, but. Yeah, um, yeah. so the Ambassador Hotel um, was the a famous hotel in Los Angeles. Um, I believe that was the hotel where Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, um, if I'm not mistaken on that. Um, but I, I'm interested in, in history and I'm interested in my environment. So um, a lot of the times I'll, I'll kind of do these research dives into Los Angeles history, um, just sort of like, lost landmarks, um, you know, buildings or places that used to exist but don't anymore. Um, because I want my work to have 
you know, this timeless quality where, you know, it's made in the present, but maybe it speaks to something in the past or something in the future. Um, you know, it's like, I like to build these imagined spaces that have traces of history to them. And uh, so I came across this photograph of the Ambassador Hotel and it had this really interesting circular archway um, at its entrance that I thought was such an interesting form. Um, and so that was sort of the basis for the piece. And then everything else kind of, you know, I just create on my own. Um, and then, you know, so it's the, this architecture of the hotel, but then it almost looks like it could be a tree or like a mushroom, just, you know, something from nature. Um, and then I just put a, a body kind of like contemplating and like sitting reflectively like in that space. So that's how that piece came to be. Um, and then, uh, Faith, we have one question in regards to your choice of materials, um, papyrus specifically, to paint on that. Papyrus, it's a tricky thing, you know, but uh, I, I relate to it <clears throat> because of my childhood, um, uh, going through the papyrus swamps in Paraguay and we would pick um, papyrus and we would, you know, we had studied the Egyptians. I had very good schooling in, in German. Um, so we knew all about the Egyptians and how they used papyrus to write on and draw on. And I'd seen a lot of papyrus uh, manuscripts in the British Museum, for example, incredible. I mean, they are like thousands of years old and they're like, they look like new. So I wanted to really experiment with papyrus, which turns out to be not very easy in many ways because it's very, very strong, but it cracks, mm -hmm. you know? And so, um, so it's very challenging in a way. And, you know, so, but I really felt like, so these became sort of these tapestries um, that are full of imagery from South America and, um, you know, in various ways. For example, the passion flower. Mm -hmm. Passion flower comes from Paraguay. Um, it's um, it's um, the Guarani Indians um, worship the passion flower, and so um, now you can find it all over the, the world in many different um, forms. But um, so the passion flower. So I'm doing I'm doing collage here. I work with collage a lot, actually, in many different ways. And then thinking about the extraction technologies uh, that that were so linked to um, colonization and, you know, the, the, the gold mines and the tin mines and the silver mines and um, the incredible amounts of extraction from the new world to the old and um, still going on big time. So kind of weaving these stories in a way. Um, Thank you. Um, we have a question from Hendrik Folkertz. Uh It's quite long, so I was wondering whether maybe Hendrik might want to unmute himself and ask the question himself. Uh, I don't know if we're uh, technically able to do that, so someone just let me know, although I also read out the question myself. I think I'm unmuted, no? Can oh, everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. yes, we can hear you. Hi. Hi, thank you so hey, much Hendrik. for this. This is, hey, hey, how are you? <laughs> Good to hear you. I can't see you. Where are you? I am here. You're in Chicago. <laughs> Chicago. Um, so I'll keep it brief. I was really interested in the uh, conversation you had around sort of, um, sort of the care in your work and how care can be extended to different sort of, uh, sort of parts of your uh, practice, really. And you talked a bit about sort of visualizations of, uh, sort of care, but I'm also curious how it extends to other parts of your work, for instance, to uh, performance, to sort of the sort of like sort of the relationship you've built with other uh, artists over time and sort of uh, other peers but also through let's say your uh, i mean uh, activism if, if that's a word you feel sort of uh, okay with so yeah really <laughs> to kind of flesh out um that that care aspect of, of your work a bit more yeah that's really interesting because um you know, in a way, I never really thought about that, about my work in that way. 
I thought about it more as like, I'm gonna throw a big rock in your lovely pool and you're gonna be upset. But um, <laughs> as it turns out, that doesn't seem to be my nature all the time. So, um, so actually this care, just this example is very good actually with the passion flow because you know, there's, there's a lot of collage in there and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of making tiny little marks and, um, and using some of the lace work, images of the lace work of the Guarani Indians and so on. So in a way it's really a labor of love, you, you know, which is also what care is in a certain sense, right? The labor of love and the labor of trying to, um, trying to um, relate and and make make visible perhaps um, how precious um, the world is and how precious all the things in it are and you know nature and the human body and culture and everything we make and everything we care about and the animals, you know, and so that is, I guess, a kind of universal care in a certain way, you know, of, you know, making everything um, as best we can and preserving it in a certain way. And um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. Henry, no, thank but... you. It's a, it's a fantastic response. Thank you. Well, and if I can just like build on that for a quick sec, I, I think both Faith and I are really sincere makers. We, you know, I, I, came, sure. I was, <laughs> when, when I was coming up at SAIC, it was this moment in the, you know, early 2000s where there was this interest in like ironic art making, or there was this like sarcasm or like, oh, this is like a joke kind of, you know, painting that I just made or I don't care about it isn't that funny and I always hated that attitude because to me it's like if you're going to devote time to making something you should care about it <laughs> you should you should have like a reverence for it because you know to make art is you know to some extent a luxury a luxury for for a lot of people so if you have the ability to do that you should really care about what you're making and it should be sin a sincere effort. And, you know, I know that's really important to me and I definitely see that in your work too, Faith. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that rings true for me, yeah. I just wanna jump in um, and kind of build on Hendrick's question a little bit for, um, for you, Faith. This idea of care, I, I, I think about the way that you have lived, you know, the last 50 years of Cure as both, you know, artist an activist, but also as educator, mm. uh, which I think is a big part of a relationship to your work, including, you know, the way that you speak about sort of lost knowledge, um, things that have been lost to time. And I think that your work gets to that core of educating public or trying to remember these things lost in the past. So I was curious if you could speak a little bit about the way um, you, you know, your work as an educator has influenced uh, or been part of your practice. Yeah, it's been a huge part of my practice, obviously. Um, my mother was a teacher, and so teaching, being a teacher was kind of sacred in our household. <laughs> and um, so, um, yeah, Ugh. I don't know. You know, I always feel when I start out working in the morning on my, on my making work, um, I always feel a little bit guilty. Uh, because, well, I was trained, I was brought up to feel guilty about everything um, in this religious commune I grew up in, so it's not hard for me to feel guilty. <laughs> but, you know, I, I feel, and why do I feel guilty? Okay, I'm going to spend the day by myself, which right now I have to, but, you know, I choose to also, uh, and I'm going to just be making, do what makes me happy. And, you know, and, but I actually have two students and I think one of my students may be watching this Zoom thing. And um, I feel- I am. <laughs> you are? 
I am. I'm here. Yeah. Here. Yeah, I recognized your voice. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think I, I've completely forgotten what I'm talking about, but um, I think it has something to do with care. Um, being an educator in care. Oh, being an educator. <laughs> yeah. So it's, you know, educating is all about care. Don't you think? I mean, it's so much about, you know, what it brings up for me also is like, I'm not good enough to do this work. You know, it is such incredible education work. It's incredibly hard. I mean, it's incredibly important. It's incredibly, you know, you can so easily, you know, do something wrong and, you know, hurt somebody. And, you know, it's sort of like, we never get actually taught how to teach. You know, we have role models. Like for me, my role model is my mother, basically, you know, um, in, in so many ways. Um, but it's it's really so it brings up so many issues of you know you you're dealing with people who are you know who are sacrificing a lot of a lot like their time their money their you know and who are taking risks you know who are who are sort of like naked there with their stuff here's what i can do you know teach me more you know and it's it feels like this incredible responsibility and then you know I actually am getting as much out of it hopefully or perhaps even more out of it than they are you know and I often say everything I know I learned from my students um, and you know and that's that's I really mean that so thank you for um, we are coming up on the hour, so Sarah, I just want to see if there's anything you wanted to jump on and, and say about that. Um, and then, I, uh, Stefano, I think we're probably looking to, to wrap up. Yeah, if there's any other remaining questions, you know, just pop them in the chat. But um, otherwise, you know, thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm glad that we could have both of these artists together, both in the presentation for the Freeze online viewing room, as well as for this conversation. Thank you, George, for all of your support of our artists and the incredible essay that you wrote about this uh, connection between the two artists. And, you know, thank you to all of the viewers that have participated and all the thoughtful questions and everything. Uh, but yeah, if you get a chance, please do check out all of the images of Faith and Sarah's work in the online uh, viewing platform for Freeze. Uh, and thank you also to Julie Rodriguez Widholm who curated that section of the Chicago tribute that we're participating in. Well, and I just want to say it was a dream of mine to show with Faith Wilding someday. So to to ah. have happen is really amazing, and I'm so thankful well, to all of it you. It was really to show with you, Sarah. So maybe one of these days we'll actually do it in person. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I have been in your studio very briefly once. But well, I, I should say, I feel like you know, maybe we missed out, but uh, Sarah is going to be exhibiting at the club next year. So at least your works will be in the same building together. Oh, cool. so that's All right. Great. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be great. The club is a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Try to make it that. Now that they admit women. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, George and Stefano. And Thank you. Sarah. Hi. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thank you so much.